I want you all to think about things that you like to do in your free time, things that people do for fun. Home brewing, quilting, mountain biking, gardening. Jousting, fishing, woodworking, you know, stuff like that. In a lot of ways, these are interests are like what we see in bluegrass and old time music. You know, brewing, uh, people go from garage home brewing and then they go to having a larger microbrewery company. And companies that sell equipment like uh, Stuart McDonald are kind of like the companies that sell uh, brewing equipment. Uh, fishing has led to a huge chain of outdoor equipment stores, the Bass Pro Shops, among other things, right? Pet fanciers can be uh, animal welfare advocates or just interest themselves in one particular breed, like old-time players interested in just a few micro-regional players or styles. So think about it. What industries arise with these interests in the music? We'll talk about these kind of industries and the people behind them, the publications, the media, and at the end we'll talk a little bit about this tension between old and new that comes up in a new way during this period of time, the 1970s and 80s. One important new focus during this time is instruments, especially vintage ones. George Grun worked for a while as part of GTR, an important uh, part of the Nashville resurgence of bluegrass and old-time music in interests says that while the music industry prospered during the 1960s and 70s, guitar manufacturing went in a highly commercial direction, such that most instruments of the late 1960s through the mid-1980s are not highly regarded by collectors. They tend to be mass-produced commercial products. During this period, many professional musicians used vintage instruments and performed simply because the new ones did not suit them. Frankie's saying he's, they didn't really suit him either. And that's from a Fretz magazine in February 1984. Interestingly enough, the growth of Japanese manufacturing and then other places in Asia got in the, were, were part of manufacturing bluegrass-related instruments. Ibanez, Yamaha, uh, musicians were going over to play in Asia and soon instruments were traveling these same routes as well. Now, Grun says... Interestingly enough, though my greatest experiences with acoustic instruments from 1976 until a few months ago, most of the dollar volume of my shop's business centered around electric guitars, particularly solid body instruments. In the past few months, this has changed dramatically. Sales of solid body guitars have fallen drastically, while hollow body guitars and acoustic guitars, banjos and mandolins, are in much greater demand. In the past 10 months, overall business has picked up and the nature of the demand has altered. Rockabilly and country music are prospering, and a new, highly sophisticated style of acoustic music seems to be evolving. Now, no uh, market, he continues, can be any more stable or sophisticated than its clientele. Classical music, for example, appeals to educated and moneyed clients, resulting in a relatively stable and high-priced market for violins, violas, cellos, and classical instruments. Punk, on the other hand, is fad-oriented and results in a fad-oriented and much lower-priced market for the instruments. Classical instruments, he says, tend to be a better investment over the long term. And he says the same thing uh, with uh, fretted instruments that we're used to in this music. It's been more stable than the electric market. Quote, fine vintage acoustic fretted instruments have excellent investment potential since so they have extremely fine craftsmanship, excellent sound, and most models are still priced higher than a modern replica. So I'd like to continue with another link to classical music, that of notation in pedagogical literature. First, a short history of tablature. This is notation that speaks to the body more than to abstract ideas of music. The tabs tell you where to put your fingers and when. Guido D'Arezzo was uh, an early innovator in thinking of new ways to map uh, musical sound to the body and to something written down. And early tablature continued this idea of linking fingers to, uh, finger placement to sounds. By the 19th century, fretted instrument culture 
had included debates on notation. Uh, how do we notate music for mandolins and banjos and guitars that were a part of this uh, BMG movement circa 1900? So question for you all, how much of your learning in bluegrass or old time music happened with written materials? How much did you use tablature or other kinds of notation as beginners, as mid-level players, and, and today? So along with the tablature and the pedagogical um, materials, we started to see other kinds of, of publications come up. And I'm curious if y'all can think of what uh, predecessors to this kind of material have we seen uh, in this class and, and in Bluegrass History 1. Well, we've seen Bluegrass songbooks from the Opry, from individual artists, and from publishers like Peer International. They uh, would sell these at the Opry. They would sell them at, at shows. It was a way for them to make money. And they included songs. Uh, in the 1950s, we have the Seeger books. I, I had forgotten that Peggy Seeger also made a book, but Pete Seeger's book from the 1950s was a key part of many people learning about the banjo and how to play it. Here's a question for you. What would change in the 1970s with the creation and sale and use of more how-to learning materials? So Earl Scruggs' book, originally published in 1968, was in collaboration with Bill Keith. And Keith mainly did the transcriptions. Uh, he did them so he could learn the Scruggs style. Uh, think about it. Uh, transcription is one of the main ways to learn a style. Oak publications later would produce instructional books uh, using material from all sorts of folks, including Bill Keith. Um, and also our own Jack Tottle, who helped start a program here at ETSU. His 1975 mandolin book offered graduated self-instruction so that students could learn on their own. And this is great, right? Uh, it's really helpful, but how does it affect how the music sounds if so many people are learning to play this music, this style, this way? The rising musical literacy led to raising the bar on technique and on musical ability. There are other things maybe that aren't as developed, right? What do these books not teach? In 1976, Pete Wernick's Oak Bluegrass Songbook uh, has a discussion about vocal technique, but still singing is, is really little explored. Rosenberg on page 340, 343 talks about this conflict, a personal style, a bodily and social element as a part of singing. Quote, one is supposed to sing bluegrass from the heart, but for most urban fans who were you know newly come to this music perhaps, singing was assumed to be either important or done in one, unimportant or done in one's own singing style. So there's maybe a, a clash with wanting to sound like Bill Monroe if you were born and raised in Brooklyn, right? Um, it's complicated. Well, other kinds of publications were happening. Banjo Newsletter had a lot of pedagogical things, how to play things uh, on your instrument, but also history and culture about the instrument. It was one of the many publications that emerged, uh, first starting in 1973. Um, unlike many of the other publications I'll talk about, it has remained. I wonder if this says anything about banjoists or about the banjo newsletter. So Pickin was established in 1974. It, it was more focused on a newsstand presentation with higher production values and included a lot of discussions of older instruments. It had a lot of posters and old catalogs. And this made it, uh, perhaps more focused on the northern urban young people. Roger Simonoff, the technical director for Pickin, uh, established, uh, published books that help people use uh, Stuart McDonald kits. They uh, were more able to learn about the intricacies of this pre-war uh, building style that made these older instruments so good. And now more people were able to use those techniques to build good new instruments. Like the festival boom, the periodical boom faded. As Carlton Haney declined, the Mule Skinner News died. Pickin lasted until 1979 when it was taken over by Fretz, which was much less bluegrass and string band oriented. Rosenberg discusses the population that were reading these magazines. According to a study, he says they're largely male, 
in college or after college, they're young, they own 3.5 instruments on average. It's like having 2.5 kids. They play multiple styles and they want to learn jazz. It's an interesting glimpse of, of that population. I wonder how different that is from today. Now to records. I usually have some on hand, but I don't have many at home here today. First major labels, RCA, MCA, dropped their Bluegrass Stars. And Monroe is really the only one left uh, on MCA. All the other folks really are, are set adrift and have to find a new record label home. Small record companies uh, in folk music or related fields uh, are competitive in this market in Bluegrass. Some of the things that made these smaller local labels effective in releasing Bluegrass material is similar to what was happening in the 1940s and 50s, right? Remember King and Richard Tone and their success in, the, in, in this earlier period because they were small. So in the 1970s and 80s, uh, what were benefits? Uh, so records, if you worked on a small record label, uh, the records were self-produced. They were not part of the larger studio assembly line. The DIY local aspect was marketable in the 1970s. And with all these things, think about this. These are things that are kind of applicable to the situation today as well. Artists had lots of freedom to do what they wanted because they were mostly working in this smaller independent framework. There was not much promotion from the label since these were not really big budget labels. But ads and specialty publications like, all, like the ones I was talking about Festival sales and live concert sales maximized the publicity that was available, and they were still able to sell um, to move their product. And few advance payments. Like you, you wouldn't get an advance from a small record label to make your record in the 1970s. But the records would stay in print for a long time since production costs were so low, and you weren't in debt to the label at all. So there's more cost, uh, financial flexibility in it. Now, in 1970, Rounder Records joined Rebel and County, which were existing smaller labels. And researcher Carlin showed Rounder to have the largest catalog in 1976. They're an interesting company. Uh, they're often called Countercultural Capital Capitalism, a collective of the Rounder founders. And they did it as a side job at first, like musicians do with their own craft and business. But their catalog grew. It was more similar to counties, starting first with Old Time and then adding Bluegrass in 1971, a year after their founding. They had this interesting series of uh, studio star albums featuring one performer with a bunch of hot pickers playing on it. Really, a bunch of the same people. They would just feature one, uh, one person. Uh, this series featured seldom seen Dobros, Mike Aldridge, David Grisman, Tony Rice, and led to a lot of boundary crossings in style, region, and various studio locations. As well, re, uh, reissues by Rounder and others brought older major label releases back into circulation and bringing them to new audiences. Now, meanwhile, the, there's this interesting situation. Country Music Heritage, or CMH, founded by German-born Martin Harley, had more traditional artists like Mac Wiseman, Lester Flatt, Reno, Harrell, Carl Story is recording with them, the Osbournes, the Stonemans. Uh, they, they found a, a port in the storm after being dropped by their major labels with CMH. Now, ironically, now the label, controlled by Harley's son, produces the Pickin' On uh, series, which kind of has a different thing. Now, in these smaller labels, we can see a tension between the good things about being small and local and the inevitable lure of big time success. Uh, it's kind of like the tension between old and new that's always been a part of bluegrass. It's, it's good to be one or the other, but inevitably it always seems to be kind of between the two. And I'll close with a few notes about this idea of progressive and, and traditional and the tension between them. Gary Henderson's show on WAMU in Washington, D.C. eventually would grow to a four hour show every Saturday morning in 1973. And his format was a set of songs with no talking. Just play the music. But he would add occasional interviews with visiting artists. It became really popular and also raised interest in the older recordings that he would play. Uh, a move towards traditionalism in the late 1970s 
included uh, acoustic albums by the Osbournes and Mac Wiseman. Of course, Monroe keeps his work going in mostly the same direction he's been going in. And younger performers like Joe Val and Larry Sparks are described as hardcore or traditional or mainstream bluegrass. And this is a new category since uh, these aren't uh, first or even second generation musicians. They're younger people looking back and making older things, older sounds and repertory new again. Now think about this as a historian. The fact that they have to declare that I think indicates that the mainstream of bluegrass at the time is becoming more progressive. Uh, just if you think about that, looking back, we can get some of the psychology of the situation. Now, uh, a look at the Flying Fish label shows another mix of old and new. Bruce Kaplan, formerly president of the Chicago Folklore Society, founded Flying Fish in 1974. And he featured some trad acts like Lester Flatt, of all people, with a rec uh, record in 1975, but mostly progressive ones like the Newgrass Revival, uh, John Hartford, and Norman Blake. And Norman Blake is a really interesting case. He's born in Chattanooga, Tennessee in 1938, and he's known more now uh, amongst bluegrassers, I think, for his more traditionalist writing, like Last Train from Poor Valley. Um, a lot of these songs that a lot of bluegrassers play today are more these... Uh, they, they sound like they're really old songs. But a lot of his material from the 70s was lyrically and very musically progressive. Talk to Greg Reich about that. You can learn more about it. Uh, there's especially this song, Gray Coat Soldiers, from his Fields of November album from 1974. And this the album from 1975, it was called Old and New, really makes that very overt. I can't include that media here, but on the YouTube playlist for that connected with this video, you can catch some more of it. Now, I've also put up some videos on the YouTube playlist. Uh, uh, some A group that I think really mixes uh, tradition and innovation well, or two groups, actually. And a big part of what they do is uh, in, to negotiate between the old and the new is to include humor. The Dry Branch Fire Squad, signed by Rounder in 1981, are part of Rosenberg's discussion about humor. He describes Ron Thomason, who was born in Virginia, uh, his sense of humor on page 357. Ron has, quote, the perspective of a sophisticated native offering observations based on affection for a culture which he feels with the ambivalence of the migrant. It's a, lot, it's a complicated quote to think about there. Look it up there on page 357 in chapter 12 in Rosenberg. And Ron, Dramas, Ron Thomason has this real dry sense of humor, but it, it's always there. He's been the main uh, MC for the Dry Branch Fire Squad. And uh, he brings this very wry uh, commentary to the music and to the world and everything he talks about. Now, the Colorado-based group Hot Rise debuted on Flying Fish in 1979. And like Ron Thomason, they use humor in a very specific way. And I don't know if, if very many other people have done this. They created this whole fictional alter ego band called Red Knuckles and the Trailblazers as a way of referencing and lampooning, but simultaneously celebrating country and Western music and country music history in general. And I think that the, their version of Honky Tonk Man is just a great example of this. So there's a link to that as well. They're just, it's hilarious and they, they, they play at this idea that this is older music and they create these personas to carry that music out. But at the same time, they rock it out. It's really good music. So thumbs up for, for Red Knuckles. Now through the 1980s, traditionalists like the Johnson Mountain Boys would emphasize the past while some continue to negotiate between progressive and traditional approaches, uh, seeking the audience that would allow them to keep working to you know, to find festival gigs, places on the circuit that would allow them to, to just stay in business as a band. This sounds like bluegrass to me, right? This tension between old and new, making a living versus doing it for fun. Uh, thanks for thinking about all these parts of the history. Remember to keep your ears open and to keep thinking about the people who are part of the history who are making these songs and making these sounds. All right, catch you next time.